Hey, today I'm speaking to Sam Hunter McGee. He is the Associate Director at the Lehman Program on Creativity and Entrepreneurship at the Harvard University. Why Harvard University, just like MIT, has a platform to allow students to mix art, creativity with business and entrepreneurship? What should business managers know about this young generation that will find themselves in the job market in less than four years? What are the benefits for engineering and business professionals when they work with the Creative Artsy Group? All and more in today's episode. We are being told to choose between the left and right brain, between studying art and engineering, between creative and analytical thinking. Our society tells us that art and business are not connected. But what if society is wrong? What if it misleading us? The good news is that understanding what art is can bring us to a new revelation. Art does matter in innovation, technology and entrepreneurship. And with the help of this podcast and its guests, you as well will learn that art is not an object. Art is a mindset. You are listening to the Artian Podcast with me, Nir Hindi. Hey listeners, as always, thanks for coming back. You are the reason we are doing this podcast. A quick reminder before we start our episode. We plan to have you, our listeners, as a guest on a future special Q&A episode. Please send us your recorded question to podcast at theartian.com. We would love to hear from you. Today's episode will shed light on the work leading institutions like MIT and Harvard are doing to promote creative entrepreneurship. Why is it important? This year showed us that a new mindset is required when it comes to significant issues. And just last October, the World Economic Forum published their Future of Jobs 2025 report, and in it, the skills we will need in the job market. Among them, creativity, originality, resilience, flexibility, and social leadership. All of these skills and others are being addressed in the program Sam has been running for years and which I'm fortunate to take part in. Thanks to Sam. Sam, welcome to the Artian podcast. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Sam, can you take a moment to introduce yourself? Absolutely. My name is Sam McGee. I, I'm currently the Associate Director on Creativity and Entrepreneurship at the Bach Center for Learning and Teaching at Harvard University. Before that, I was the Student Program Manager at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and, and before that, uh, a school teacher, an art teacher for many years. I've been living in Massachusetts and on the East Coast my whole life. I have okay. a 19-year-old son. I live here with my <laughs> wife and a little dog. <laughs> Actually, two dogs now. Okay. Two dogs now. <laughs> so before we dive deep into what you are doing uh, today, you and me actually got to know each other through the work you are doing in MIT. You were kind enough, generous enough to invite me to be mentoring this beautiful competition, MIT Creative Arts Competition. Can you tell us about this competition? What does it mean creative arts competition in such a technological oriented institution? So when I started at MIT, I realized a, a few things pretty quickly. The biggest one was that the desire for the arts and the practice of the arts was prevalent throughout the entire student body, practically. There may be an assumption that at a science and tech school, creativity in the arts don't exist, but the opposite is, is true. And in fact, they exist in, in a really healthy state. And so I was very, very excited to see that. And I saw an opportunity there. I started mentoring and advising startups as this startup culture took effect at MIT. One of the, the things I hear students say is, you know, I, I want to have two failed startups before I graduate. <laughs> and so there's a lot of it going on there. And I was watching these 60 pitches and 60 minute festivals where you would just see idea after idea after idea. Each team will have five minutes to pitch. Everybody knows that. Uh, they will then have five minutes for questions and answers after their pitch. And I realized after doing this for a while, where are the artists? There are plenty of MBAs, there are plenty of coders, uh, plenty yeah. of entrepreneurs. The arts are involved, but where is the true representation? So I, I had this idea of creating a competition specifically for students who are creating ventures that focus on creativity and the creative arts. Now you're actually continuing and developing your work and you do similar work 
in Harvard University. Before we dive deep into the program at Harvard, I want to ask you, why do you think it's important to give this space for the creative entrepreneurship? Why we see more on, of those competition programs around the, the globe? My first reaction to that would be the power, the momentum, the growth, the interest is starting with the students. So students are, are entering the academy with this desire to solve for big global issues. I see this both MIT and Harvard. They're interested in really making a positive impact. So the idea of the traditional business is definitely mutating, it's changing, it's evolving into this new space where students are less interested in the bottom line in terms of finances, in terms of the dollar, and they're more interested in having a positive impact. And that may sound on its face, okay, great, you have a nonprofit that does something nice. It's not the, that simple. It's a lot more complicated than that. And in order to, to live in this space, one needs to start thinking creatively. And so the value of creativity is definitely on the rise. And it's directly related, I think, to this exploration of this new space. Now you are at Harvard, but uh, MIT still continue running this uh, program. And I'm interested to understand why institutions like MIT and Harvard that are very recognized and very well known actually take the time to develop this program. What is the value of having the space to these artists to actually do it? That's a terrific question. And I'm excited to answer it. And I feel like it's slightly different at either institute. So at MIT, I felt as if the most traction I was getting with these ideas was, was absolutely with the student body. There were obviously very supportive faculty and administrators uh, there as well, but it certainly hadn't bubbled up yet in my mind, uh, the power of, of creative entrepreneurship and the need for a space for creative entrepreneurs to build their ventures but it was absolutely already happening in the student body. And it wasn't necessarily happening under the definition of creative entrepreneurship. There were just students who had these great ideas who were trying to activate them. They would come across some research that would trigger, that would create a little glimmer of an idea of how they could possibly solve for X. And then their enterprise thinking enough so that they pull somebody in from a different course over here and a student down the, down the street from Harvard over here. And all of a sudden they're having these dynamic backgrounds solving for big global issues. And so I did my best to create a, a more formalized sort of structure around that to allow for them to have exchange of ideas. So really it's community building was the start at MIT. A little bit different at Harvard, um, but equally exciting. So it's a spot on kind of point that you are touching that I really want to uh, discuss with you because obviously... You know, the job environment always looking for the STEM, the science, technology, engineering, and math. And we are always searching to recruit from MBA program and engineering program. But even though we are looking for the STEM, you have all those artists, even they might be studying medicine or maybe studying engineering. Why do you think this young generation see the appeal of creativity, understand the need of arts in our day-to-day Yes, even in the workplace, things that the older generation, if I would say, call it that way, didn't seem even connected. They didn't see the relationship between art and other disciplines. Why these young ones, you think, are so attracted by arts? I, I love that question. And, and I say this all the time. I say this all the time. And I think it's Picasso, but we're all born artists and it is slowly taught out of us. And I think my answer is it is no longer slowly being taught out the new generation that is now being faced with epic problems. And so, and also to touch on the STEM, in my thoughts around that, everybody knows STEAM because we have to make sure the arts are represented. I feel that in fact, the arts are so integral, they permeate STEM so much that in fact, to put them out and call attention to them in that way does a disservice to it. It should be S-A-T-A-E-A-M-A -A 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 because creativity is anywhere. There's no innovation without creativity. Totally. Yeah, yeah. What do you recognize among this young generation beside this understanding, beside the fact that they actually see these, I would say, big challenges that need to be uh, uh, identified and solved? 
What would you tell the business managers that are listening to us? What do they need to know about this young generation and creativity and arts? I would say, first and foremost, keep your, keep your mind wide open uh, for ideas to apply sort of the traditional model of what a transaction looks like does a disservice to your company. I think business managers need to rethink what commerce looks like, rethink what sort of our social culture even is beginning to look like. You know, you mix in the pandemic into the formula and all of a sudden everything is different. And so in order to scale and grow and evolve and be athletic and flexible and pivot to your audience, to your customers, you need to have an open mind and you need to be willing to experiment. You need to be willing to take these ideas that this new generation is offering to us and really run with them without fear of failing because it's it's not a failure to step towards the actual correction that your, your company may need. No, I think what you said is that your students come and tell you, I want to fail at least twice before I graduate, kind of show the pace that they see innovation. And obviously, right. I can already see frustration that they will have with the job environment. And I think it's kind of a lesson for managers, how we can be more agile, more flexible to actually adapt to this young generation uh, needs. So it's kind of invite, obviously, a question that I have in mind and I'm interested is that how do you think the program influence your students? I think what it does first and foremost is show the students that there are other students doing this. Uh, they're not the only ones having these ideas and really wanting to execute on them and doing it in an empathetic way. And so I think when you know a new burgeoning entrepreneur has these ideas and they see other people doing it, it, it allows them to feel as if they can do it too. It gives them permission in a way to go ahead and try. And that's, that's when you have two students and when you have four, it does the, the same thing exponentially and so on and so forth. And so all of a sudden you have a community of like-minded people who are all striving to do the same thing, solve for big problems with enterprise and art thinking. And, and it creates a really interesting culture that I think is particularly important right now. It's, an, it's a really inclusive culture that isn't concerned with idea theft or territory. Everybody is in it to support everybody else because if one person succeeds, the person next to them will have a much higher chance of doing the same thing. And, and the market is plenty big right now for problem solving ventures uh, that are built creatively. So it creates a community Uh, which I think is really probably the most important part of this, a community that then networks and continues to spread out. One of the things that you mentioned and I like is that this young generation actually in those competitions, especially break the barriers and disciplines. So the teams that I meet, that you will have one from engineering, one from biology and one from the arts, and they are all working together. And I can only wish that we will see more diverse team like this in real life. So, you know, Sam, what I did is that actually I took the time and I asked one of your students how the program influenced her. Hello, my name is Jerry, and I'm a recent MIT graduate, and I currently work as a design strategist at Tidepool, which uh, creates software for people with diabetes. I studied art. I majored in art and design, and I also minored in computer science and biomedical engineering. I think that was one of the reasons I went to MIT, because I knew I would be in an environment with creatives, with technologists, with people who are interested in policy, kind of at the intersection of all these fields. And I really wanted to interact with these students. So I think having an art scholars program that united all of us with our love of the creative arts really helped create this shared connection where we could also talk about these various disparate fields. I think having that shared creative arts passion really helped um, have a common language, even if we were coming at it from different perspectives, whereas um, some people might tackle a problem or a prompt or a brief from a more technical perspective, looking at how exactly we can accomplish it, whereas um, others might attach it from a, attack it from a more theoretical or conceptual perspective. I think having those elements unite is really what creates a great piece of work that is interesting for the public, engaging, and accessible. Sam, I want to ask you now about the program itself, the one that you are running now in the in Harvard, the Lehman Program on Creativity and Entrepreneurship, where you are actually the Associate Director. Tell us a bit about this program. What is the purpose? How does it actually look? What will the students do over there? I know I ask a lot of questions, so take it as, as you want. <laughs> 
<laughs> Absolutely. I've been very lucky to have this sort of smooth transition from one place to the other. I left MIT to join uh, the Harvard Initiative for Learning and Teaching, which is uh, as an entrepreneur in residence, which is a platform for students, especially in education, who have startup ideas to find resources and funding. And so I had a one-year appointment there. And one of the reasons why I think I earned that appointment is because while at MIT, I caught the bug and I have a few of my own ventures that I'm working on. Uh, they've been a lot of fun and they've informed me a lot and actually allowed me to speak with a little bit more authority about actually being an entrepreneur. But that job uh, really nicely transitioned into this new one. And as you said, the Lehman Program on Creativity and Entrepreneurship was funded by Jorge Paulo Lehman, a Brazilian who went to Harvard in, in the 60s, went on to great success, seeing the need to help students activate the ideas that are generated in their research, generated in their general education, in a way that can make positive and empathetic social change out in the world. And so what we're trying to do is create a formal process where we teach those sorts of things. So we teach how to be a good global citizen. We teach How do you do how I, do you teach someone to be a global citizen because it's actually a program that every week they are doing it right yes it is so the course in the two credit courses are following a, a really interesting structure we have obviously tons of pedagogy experts subject matter experts around us to really put a lot of thought and effort into building this program in just the right way for the gl good global citizen uh, piece the, the class for example we lean heavily on the, the uh, SDGs the that lay out the sustainable development goals that lay out 17 tiles on essentially best practices for each of these very important things. And so the, the class itself this year, for obvious reasons, is tackling problems that were laid bare by COVID. And so environment, climate change, and social justice are three bi big parts of this. Uh, so that's just one part of the Lehman program is this credit bearing uh, class where we also talk about design thinking, creative entrepreneurship, all of those are built into this class. But in addition to that, we have an accelerator where we have mentors, as you are one, networking and funds to help support uh, student ventures. And then again, just like at MIT, uh, trying to build the biggest possible multi-generational community filled with experts, filled with diversity so that we can have the biggest bank of ideas possible, and then each support one another in, in, in actually launching those out into the world. So how many students you have now participating in the program? So we just started this in September. So I actually began remotely. So at the end of March, I began my new job remotely uh, and have done my best to build it with the vision of Dr. Rob Liu in, in mind. So Dr. Liu was the faculty director for the Lehman program and He is by all accounts a rock star professor. Students absolutely loved him. He's a professor of the practice and the sciences. And uh, he sadly passed away recently. And so now the team at, at Lehman and the Institute are really, really doing our very best to carry Rob's vision on. And that vision is student focused. The vision is to activate student ideas. Uh, the vision is to help Harvard students who want to have an empathetic and positive social impact uh, and solve for these big global problems. We really want to help them be able to do that. And so the accelerator, the community, and the classes are all part of, of the program. And so right now, 50 teams in our first go-around to answer Five your zero. question. Five zero. Five zero teams. Yeah, yeah. so there's interest, <laughs> yes. uh, which is great, which is great. And, yeah, so it's another uh, opportunity hope to, scale. To, to say thank you for inviting me. I'm mentoring three of those teams and... <laughs> I have to admit, I'm always passionate and excited to work with this young generation. First of all, it keeps me young. And we young. love having you. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> first of all, it keeps me young. Second of all, I yes. always like to see fresh idea and interesting idea. I mean, um, yes. and what yeah. I love about the students, also they are very humble. So one of them tell me, oh, yeah, I mean, we, I was working on that and I'm asking him, okay, how many active users you have? Oh, no, it's not a lot, just 2,000. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. We are team Teach to Learn. My name is Derek Beckvold. This is Mark Adams and Robert Jordan. And together we have an online cultural exchange and mentorship platform that connects musicians across world regions. Hi, I'm Sarah Wilson. I represent the team Octave Prosthetic and we're designing a line of functional jewelry for people with congenital hand defects, so birth defects of the hand. 
My team's name, my team's project is Along Fault Lines. It's an infrastructure for emotional recovery through cultural exchange programs in populations that have been affected by urban trauma. My name is Emily Salvador and our project is Glitch. We're working on AI and fashion, specifically creative uses that we can help um, minorities and, and women and the environment through projects that we put out in the AI and fashion space. So in this program is for how long? A student can join two, three, three months? Yeah, the Lehman program is focused primarily on, on undergraduates. Our hope is that we are really engaging them as quickly as we can as they get into Harvard College and have their ideas. The thought is that the credit bearing courses would be sort of augmenting or, or moving alongside their other courses so that if they have an idea in one of the classes they're taking, they, they can come with that idea to us and in partnership with faculty and partnership with administration and the experts that we obviously have at Harvard, we help incubate those, those ideas. So this program just started now in Harvard, but you already have experience of a few years in MIT. And I'm wondering if there are one, two, three projects that kind of you remember and worth knowing about. Can you tell us a story or stories about some of those projects? I have thought of three that really specifically speak to the arts. And, that, and I was always talking about when I was at MIT, the continuum of the arts. And so you're creating a venture. Let's not focus on the consumer as much as uh, we do typically. Let's focus on the creative side of, of the continuum. And, and I think these three businesses do an interesting job of that. The first one was one of our earliest ones. And its idea was to take discarded saris from India uh, this beautiful fabric uh, that had been outworn, and then take those saris, buy them at a fair market value from the folks who are collecting them, upcycle these saris into high fashion. So it was really a fashion-based business. So you had sort of a vineyard vine look coming out of these upcycled saris, selling them at high target prices, and then making sure that they were then sending a, a very healthy and appropriate portion of that money back uh, to help create this sort of dynamo of success between them, West Coast, you know, San Francisco based and in India. So that's one. Another one that I thought was really interesting was called Cherry Stems. And, and what it did was allowed a user to capture a sound in their environment and then using a filter like an Instagram filter. So you'd have wow. reggae, pop, electric, you know, EDM. You could take that sound and place sort of a, a generalized feel of, over that sound and create your own little snapshots of sound. I thought that was really fascinating and it sort of helped democratize, you know, create citizen artists in an interesting way and in a similar way that Instagram. No, it's did. amazing, Sam, because now I think about... I don't know if you know, but uh, Snapchat actually started a residency with an artist doing something similar around sound filters. Oh, interesting. Well, there so, you go. <laughs> so you, you are just talking. It's, it seems to me that they will just be, you know, ahead of the market in a few years because now with all the use of TikTok, yes. Reels, Snapchat, all those need more than just visual filters, but rather kind of sound filter. Amazing. You bring up an interesting point. Yeah, you get to see when you work in this space and you work in these places, these ideas that are brand new, they're fresh. And yeah. it's so, so exciting. And then you see them come into market in some version form later on down the road. And it's just a lot, a lot of fun watching that happen. Yeah. So in the third story, now I'm excited. I think, as Steph mentioned, it's a space for us. It's a space for us to come together around art, operating as a artist workspace and a gallery and event space as well. So this is one I really particularly love because it really focused on the creative part of that continuum. And it's called Space Us and it's a, a, a all female team out of uh, MIT who wanted to repurpose storefronts in that in between time. And so say for instance, in Harvard Square, you would have one store go out of business or move for whatever reason, a space of time before the next one came in, they were able to renegotiate the basic lease. They were able to figure out how to interact with the owners of the buildings, with the town, uh, so that they could create pop-up spaces for artists, for local artists to show their work, to hold workshops, 
and it really, really took off. And, and, and it's an idea that's been around for a while, uh, but they approached it with a creativity, with a, a mind to design thinking in such a unique way that I that they found success where other people didn't. And so that I think that's a really great example of creative entrepreneurship. Yeah, totally. I want to mention another example because uh, you actually connected us and he was a guest on our podcast, Matthew Schifrin. And Matthew is, is blind and he actually won the competition with the helmet that they develop. Listening yeah. to Matthew talking about how yeah. the sound can enhance experience, kind of go back to the startup you just mentioned. It's interesting the two startups kind of dealt with sound. Normally we see it dealing with visual part of the world. So I wanted to bring them up, but I know that you did a podcast. So for all your listeners, yeah. head over there and check that one out after you finish this one. <laughs> yeah. Just to make sure, to give you kind of a, a bit of taste, here is what Matthew said about the competition. Oh, and that was really an incredible experience, that creative arts competition. It happened accidentally in the sense that I was at New England Conservatory and some people there said, hey, you know, MIT have a creative arts competition and you should join it and kind of see what happens. And I was skeptical because, I mean, MIT is known for their sciences. And, uh, and then I thought, you know, it's, it's worth joining. And it was really that whole experience was a really pivotal experience for me. Because at first we had all of these workshops that introduced artists to entrepreneurship. And it really trained artists in the ins and outs of starting a startup and acquiring customers and keeping them engaged and all of these very entrepreneurial things. But what was wonderful was that it was still grounded in art. So I want to ask you, because you get to work a lot with very diverse, capable talent, people that hopefully will lead the business environment, the social environments, the political maybe realms. And one of the, at least on a personal level, one of the intersections that I'm interested in is engineering and business and how they relate to the arts. And I wonder from your perspective, what are the opportunities for engineering and business world professional when they collaborate with this creative artist oriented talent? I think there's a misconception that uh, when you bring on an artist, uh, you bring on somebody who is creative, you're bringing them on to build a logo to help with your user <laughs> interface on your website. Totally. Posters. Totally. And that's, yeah, yeah. And, and, that, and, and that's, not, that, that's not the conversation we're having. Uh, the conversation we're having is, is, is about the artist's mindset. Why is that important? And so for, for businesses you need to have that particular way of thinking at the table when you're making decisions. And if you don't have that way of thinking at the table when you're making decisions, you're eliminating a lot of opportunity. So actually, it's kind of opening new opportunities to look at the world maybe differently. Absolutely. And that is something that the artist is trained to do, that the artist uh, is particularly good at, their ability to solve problems, this art thinking uh, that I love talking about. It, it is a, a, a trained and also very useful a thing to bring to problem solving. What is this art mindset or art thinking that you mentioned? One thing I realized when I started doing all of this because I came out of teaching studio arts is that as an art artist, and I love to write and draw, uh, and as a teacher of the arts, uh, students have to practice a certain way of being able to accept criticism, uh, being able to include that, that feedback into their work, being able to even allow that work to be looked at there are a handful of different areas that I think build a resiliency in an artist uh, that is crucial uh, for being able to experiment successfully in other fields. And so artists are always trying to get to that ideal conception, right? Uh, whether it's dance, poetry, flat work, conceptual work, whatever it is, they're always trying to get to a goal, an ideal goal, and, and quite often most of us never do. And so we so embrace experimentation and I guess failure, I, don't, I would never call it failure, uh, that it creates this, this resiliency. And so art thinking is a way of approaching problems that engages randomness, loves associative thinking, knows that diversity is the key for being able to actually put together disparate thoughts into new creative solutions. Uh, and it is 
uh, the ability to persist uh, through criticism and not allow it to affect your ego as much as others might so that you are still open to other people's ideas and collaboration. Yeah, spot on. I mean, I will add to this, you know, the ability of the artist to actually observe and lead with questions and offer Thank alternative. You, yes. I think the biggest realization that I had spending so many years with artists is that art is not an object. Art is a mindset. People always focus on the painting or on the book or on the song without realizing that this is just the end result of a journey, of a thinking process. What you do at your work is exactly what we are looking for in the business world. This process that will allow companies to survive in the long run and society, obviously. To really take that process apart and take a look at it and realize that, oh my gosh, everybody can do this. Everybody could walk in, into a place and, and start thinking like an artist with the appropriate work put in. It really can. And, and it's a very exciting place to be. I want to ask you, most of the time when I do my trainings around art mindset, when I give my keynote, most of the time what people tell me, art is about creativity, I'm not creative, art is not for me. And you just said something that I think is spot on. I want to shed light on what you said. What would you tell the people that think they are not creative or that art is not for them? That they're wrong <laughs> and that they are creative and they, they haven't seen it or they're not willing to recognize it or somebody needs to help them really find out and redefine what their creativity is. Everybody's creative. There's no such thing as a non-creative person. They're just exercising and practicing it in ways that maybe they're not recognizing as creative. So I feel that everybody really engages with creativity every day. And it's just a matter of reframing how you're thinking uh, about that creativity. I, I don't want to undersell the importance of, of work and of putting time in to be good at the craft of expressing your creativity. So I'm not saying everybody is out the door creating beautiful product. And again, that's not even necessary. Yeah. But everybody has creativity in them. We wouldn't be surviving if we didn't. It's a way of evolving. It's a way of reacting to our environment. It's a way of solving problems. And so I, I find it really exciting that we're sort of in a space, we're in a time where we're re-engaging with creativity. We're recognizing the value of it again. And it is cyclical. It seems like a swinging of a pendulum. But now with the tools we have, the technological tools, uh, this new ability to speak to a much broader audience, I, I feel like we're entering a new time for the celebration of creativity. And it's very exciting. Let's assume now I'm a listener. I don't think about myself creative as a creative person. You convinced me, Sam. Do you have one advice to give me what I can do to maybe re-engage or, re or ignite this yep. creative passion inside me? What should I do? Maybe one uh, thing that you will recommend. I feel very strongly that drawing should be taught in the same way that writing is taught. So writing is, is this one, I think this is so interesting. Writing is this thing that we all do. We all have to do. It's a craft that comes in its highest form, beautiful expressions of art. So we're all writing all day long. I feel drawing is the same thing. I feel drawing should be taught because it is an iterative process. People say, I'm horrible at drawing, look at my stick figure. Well, no, that is step one of drawing. <laughs> and, and I would say, find the thing that interests you or scares you the most, the thing you haven't been trying and you have been specifically avoiding and just start doing it and be unapologetic about it and share it with just the right people to start with and then share it with more people and realize that you are walking through a process just like everybody else does and, you know, I had to hit 20,000 hours before I even got past the stick figure, but many people luckily may have talents in there that get them to that point faster, but don't be afraid of it. Go for it. There's no reason not to. Yeah. What you just said kind of invites immediately two examples that I have in my mind. There is a professor in Australia that actually developed kind of a small helmet that sent pulls to your right brain for 10 minutes and he let people draw a dog. And he let them draw the dog after 10 minutes that he sent the pulse to ignite the right brain. And it's amazing to see yeah. how people start and then how they finish. And the second one is that, as you said, you might discover inside you the artist. And it reminds me of Richard Feynman, the physicist. 
uh, that actually started to paint a draw at the end of his life. So many exciting stories and connections that can go for so many uh, places. I'm just going to plug drawing one more time. It, it, is, it is such an important practice to do your best to draw every day. And, and I'm not saying you need to sit down in front of a canvas with charcoal and create a fabric study. I, it, the, the doodles that people, I watch everybody doodle during meetings all the time. Yeah. They're drawing. They're drawing and they're connecting their hand and their eye and their brain exactly. and their subconscious all at the same time. Exactly, exactly. And getting through the meeting. <laughs> it's not only creative thinking, it's also creative doing. Yes, um, yes. All the time kind of invoke more ideas, the things yeah. that I saw and that I guess you are familiar with this research that actually showed that Nobel Prize winners are three times more likely to do art because apparently when you do art with your hands, you develop exactly what you said. You're connecting your hand to your brain, things that we are not even aware of. When we so actually exciting. draw, many of you start to draw. Maybe we can do online exhibition on the Artian website after a Sam recommendation. Absolutely. Sam, we would love it. <laughs> we are getting into the end of our podcast and I want to ask you kind of a last, maybe last thoughts or things you have about this intersection of art, business, art, engineering, art and technology. It's an, an unstoppable movement. It's happening. It's happened and it's going to continue to happen. And I think the people that are on board sooner, who embrace the arts sooner, will have a competitive advantage uh, when this is an all-encompassing thing, when the creative mindset uh, and the creative practice uh, is truly recognized for how well it actually serves and that purpose is, is solving problems. and. I am just so excited that we're entering this new time. And despite the pandemic and, and despite some of the recent social unrest that I think all of us have, have seen in one way or another, creativity couldn't be injected into, into the group think at a better time. And uh, we need it. And, and I'm so excited to be working with the students that I'm working with and to be doing my best to promote this, this mindset with you. Uh, so I think just hold on and, and, and watch what happens. It's going to be exciting. <laughs> I would say amen to everything you said. <laughs> <laughs> amen. Hallelujah. Sam, thank you very, very much for your generosity, for your time, for the great work you are doing all around the world in those uh, intersections. Count on me and the Artian to always be part of every adventure that you are taking. This was a blast and thank you so much for, for asking me to join you today and, and, and for being a partner with me in this movement. I really appreciate it uh, and thanks very, very much. We are producing our podcast without any ads and we are relaying on our community's direct support. People like you, our listeners. So if you find it valuable, I will be super grateful if you could spread the word by leaving a rating and maybe a review. It will take you just 30 seconds to do so, and it is very helpful in getting these ideas to a wider audience. If you are interested to develop your artistic mindset, if you are looking to grow your business, if you want to develop the innovation competencies in your organizations, I will highly recommend you to check our workshops and trainings, all available on our website. The episode was mixed and mastered by Daniel Duran. You can subscribe to the Artian Podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Our previous shows are available on our website, www.derteyan.com slash podcast. Each episode includes show notes, guest recommendations, videos, and other materials. We can also be found on our LinkedIn page, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And you can reach us directly via email at podcast at theartian.com. Com. So I will be waiting here for you in the next episode with me, Nir Hindi. Once again, thanks for listening.